ghost story. My ghost story. My ghost story. The camera was pulled from my hand. And the things that I experienced were, you can't even explain them to people. When I saw that thing in that monitor, it literally scared me to death. Sometimes the ghosts come into the house. I see that. All of this mist just came rushing right down the center of the graveyard. It looked like a real person. Suddenly, he just vanished. Oh, oh my gosh. The hair on my arms went up. It was like a skull. And I'm thinking, this thing, it had the potential to kill. They started using this tunnel as a death shoot. The very first pictures were kind of scary. It looked like what you would think a ghost looked like. It can't be what it looks like. It was a nightmare. It was the nightmare of all nightmares. My ghost story. My ghost story. As police officers, uh, we're trained to think logically, and we basically explain things with facts. And what I've seen in this particular case is hard to explain. When I saw that thing in that monitor, it literally scared me to death. My ghost. My name is Kevin Parton. I'm a sergeant with the Oklahoma City Police Department. In June of 2002, I investigated a single vehicle accident where driver Tracy Martin had collided into a guardrail. It was late at night, and Tracy Martin was on her way home, and it appears that she just fell asleep and drove off the roadway. She was a beautiful blonde woman. She was uh, laying there with her eyes closed, and um, just appeared to be sleeping. She never regained consciousness or was able to speak while I was there at the scene. Tracy Martin was transported to an area hospital and she was maintained on life support where unfortunately she passed away due to her injuries approximately a month later. I'm a dispatcher at Puckett's Record Service and Body Shop in Oklahoma City. The morning of July 18th of 2002, I was sitting at my desk the monitor that we had to keep an eye on was sitting here to the left of me. And with my peripheral vision, it looked like somebody was running across the lot. So right then, I pulled back in my chair and I said, Colonel, look, looks like there's somebody out there in the back lot. When I turned back around to look again, you could see she was not on the ground. She was floating up in the air. It literally scared me to death. I started shaking. I ran out there right quick, see if I find, see anybody, and there wasn't nobody there. So I went on down to check by the gate, and I looked over the fence and around the cars, and then I didn't see nobody. I wasn't for sure what it was. All I knew was that it looked like a person out there. I called my husband, and I told him, I said, David, well, you need to come home and see this. So when he come home, I said, David, what does it look like to you? He said, well, that's a woman. And I said, you need to call Chris. My name is Chris Puckett. Our family owns a record service and a body shop in Oklahoma City. When David first called on the phone to tell me he wanted to show me something on the tape, I said, well, what is it? He said, well, I, I got to show you. I said, well, what is it? Well, I got to show you. David, what is it? Well, it's a ghost. Oh, bull, David. Bring it up. I'll look at it. So he brought the tape up, and, and that's when I put it in. and. I didn't really believe what I saw. It was a woman, a young woman. She was off of the ground. She was wearing overhauls, white shirt. She had short blonde hair. I was trying to think of any reason for it to not be a ghost, but it, I mean, the, it was just too obvious. It, it looked like it or she was in overalls. Um, it looked like there was, the hair was up in a bun of some sort. He was in there looking more into the film later on when an officer walked in and seen it. When I originally saw the tape, I must say it sent chills up my spine because I was the only one that had seen her at that accident scene. And when I looked at the image on the tape, right away I saw the similarities between the image and between Miss Martin the night that I had seen her. When you look at it just right, it did look like overalls or coveralls. 
and with kind of a, a bun or the hair up and and that's what we found out later is the way that um, Tracy liked to dress. The image on the videotape uh, appeared to be just moving around and, and it wasn't in a consistent fashion. It had moved clockwise and it moved counterclockwise uh, and the elevation would change. It would go up and down on the screen and you could still see through the image. So you could see the, the other cars and other items that were in the picture that were behind this particular image. And you could only see the image from one perspective when there were actually uh, about four other cameras that were there. Come to find out afterwards, the, the husband had come that day to clean out the car so that the, so the insurance company could pick it up to take it to the salvage pool. And so he removed the property, and then we prepared it for the salvage pool to pick up and got it ready for them to pick up. They didn't pick it up that evening after all, and that's why it was still there overnight, but it wasn't in the same area. It had been moved away from the back of the lot up to the front. Another detail about the incident that seemed maybe a little more than a coincidence was that the accident itself occurred at approximately 1.05 in the morning, and the image that appeared in Puckett's record it appeared at almost the same time frame. But this looking like her, she was right there by that vehicle. I mean, this writer is going to give us kids something. Their mother was out there trying to hold on for them. beginning to think we're looking at something that's not normal. My ghost story begins when my husband Mike and I went to the Waverly Hills Sanitarium in Louisville, Kentucky, which was a tuberculosis hospital from 1926 to 1961, where apparently 63,000 people died. I'm writing a fictional series about teenage ghost hunters, and I really wanted to get experiences and do the research accurately. A number of my friends were going to be visiting Waverly Hills Sanitarium. I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to get some pictures and maybe catch my friends on film. Being interested in photography, I like to take pictures of various buildings, uh, statues, places of historical value. I understood that Waverly Hills Sanitarium was allegedly haunted, but it had a great history. I went with my wife, Marley, because she was researching a book series that she was working on. The minute you drive up the hill, it's, it's very ominous sitting on the top of the hill in the dark, and it's kind of creepy. When you first walk into the place, you can't help but think, and it's an old phrase used over and over, but it's true, if these walls could talk. One of the most compelling locations at Waverly Hills Sanitarium is what they refer to as the death tunnel. This was a tunnel that goes from the hospital all the way down underneath the building to a back area where they used this initially to bring supplies to the hospital. And then apparently, from my understanding, when the deaths started occurring so rapidly, they had to get the bodies out quickly so that the other patients weren't upset by this. They started using this tunnel as a death chute. While I was in the death tunnel with four other people, we were walking down, not noticing anything. It was just very dark. We continued walking and walking, because it's a very long tunnel. We almost reached the end of the tunnel, and then I started experiencing strange feelings, like I was uh, overly dizzy, and it felt like the ground was moving. And in my vision, everything was turning white, like I was about to faint. The people that I was with had stopped in their tracks as well, and I just felt compelled to tell them what I had just experienced. When I told them what I was feeling, um, my two friends immediately said, we just had the very same feelings. And everyone stopped in our tracks. It was like something was keeping us from going on. While I was there visiting, a couple of the friends that I was there with, they were videotaping and they happened to capture the ball actually moving and they were playing with the ghost child. And then after discussing both of the, the events, we realized that both of these were happening at the very same time. We were on the third floor of Waverly Hills, and uh, of course it was dark because it was about midnight, and there's no lighting because there's no electricity. 
Uh, the only thing we had was uh, moonlight that was making its way through the windows. And I guess you could say that was a, sort of a creepy feeling because it was quiet, it was dark, there was no one else around. We were walking along and I see these two balls on the floor and one ball was circling around the other ball. And we were, you know, I was kind of freaked out by it. And so we stopped and we watched it and then we sat down and all the time we're getting the ball moving around and it's going back and forth between us and then other people joined us and it's going back and forth between them. It just got pulled out of my hand. You could have it in front of you, uh, sort of hold it with one finger, but you could feel it trying to pull away. So you just hold it for a second or two or three or four and let go of it and it would roll, and it would roll toward another person, stop, uh, maybe go around them, uh, change directions, whatnot. And so we were beginning to think we're looking at something that's not normal. The ball would roll to me, and I would stop it, and I would hold it with my finger, and basically just my fingernail, and I could feel the energy building up underneath it. It was just. It was grinding against the, the pavement underneath it, and it was just so, it was just so shocking almost, just the power that was underneath it. And then I would lift my finger, and it would just go across the room to somebody else. When we were sitting there, you start thinking about, so who is or what is making this ball move? Can you tell us your name? Are they really the ghost kids that are said to be in the Waverly Hills Sanitarium? You can't walk down a dark hallway at a place like Waverly Hills and come upon a ball that's just moving on its own with nobody doing it without it getting you right here. And I really was struck with many emotions experiencing that and witnessing it and feeling empathy for the people of Waverly Hills and what they had to go through. When you're there and something like this is happening, you can't help but be affected by it and it changes your worldview and it changes your perspective. I don't know if this child was left there and it's alone, if there's other ghosts with it, uh, if it died there. Nevertheless, no matter what the circumstances are, it's like a sad little child waiting in a hallway for someone to come by and play ball. And uh, it's gotta let you know that something else is there because this child's waiting to play and we don't know why. But I found that very sad. My ghost story. My ghost story started out in a little house in San Pedro. It was supposed to be the beginning of my life. I left my husband, me and my kids were just gonna start a new life. And instead, it was a nightmare. It was the nightmare of all nightmares, is what it was. What happened to me in that bungalow, the things that I experienced were, I, you can't even explain them to people. It was, it was something that nobody else has gone through, so how do, I, how do I talk to people about it? There was a high-pitched screeching voice over the house. Every single night it would start at one end, go all the way over and end at the other end of the house. I saw apparitions. I saw two different apparitions. One was a disembodied head the first time I went into the attic, all coming at me. That sent me running out of the house. Then there was the apparition of the of an old man who was sitting on the on the bed watching me as I walked past to use the restroom in the night. And he was sitting there and his eyes were so angry. They were just staring at me. I didn't want to, didn't want to look until the sun came up. One night, all of a sudden, this fluorescent fluid or ooze started coming from every place. I'm talking from the cabinets, from the glass. There it is. There it is, right there. Unbelievable. It was everywhere, and it was. There's no source of where that stuff came from. It just appeared, and that just prompted me. That I had to do something. So that's that's the incident that caused me to call for help. I had called a paranormal investigator who brought out a film crew. And I told them the story of what was going on, how I saw the disembodied head in the attic. And one of the researchers, you could tell right away, he was very skeptical. He did not believe anything that I was saying. Actually, I'm a still photographer. I've always been a skeptic all my life. 
I'm one of these guys that's like from the state of Missouri, you know, you have to show me, show me state. <laughs> so during the ride down there, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I don't think we're probably gonna see anything. But then all of a sudden things did start to happen. I observe uh, lights, uh, balls of light and such. I witnessed uh, blood plasma coming from the walls. We heard rumblings in the attic, there was noise. And one of the other investigators said, why don't you just go up into the attic and see, take a few pictures up there? So he did. She would look up into this small hole she had in her uh, laundry room. And that's actually where we entered to go up into the attic. I went up into the attic. It was deep, dark, black. I'm just shooting frames, just bang, 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 just like that. And into the fourth frame, the camera was pulled from my hand, drastically, radically from my hand. He let out this yell and everybody went running and he comes out of the attic. He was uh, obviously very shaken because he said the camera was actually yanked from his hand. I still think to this day there was some kind of intelligence with it because what it did was take the lens off of an SLR camera. You have to twist the lens in order to take the lens from the body of the camera and put it in two parts of the attic. The body was lens poured down in one corner in a fruit case and the lens was over by the opening of the uh, attic that really stunned all of us. And of course, here I am, Mr. Skeptic, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, something did really happen. And right away I thought, yeah, this is, a, this, this is some kind of haunting. This has to be something major. When the film crew was there filming, they have gotten uh, balls of light that uh, you cannot see with your, your eye, your naked eye. At one time, they were filming a, an interview with me and I was just answering some questions and the balls of light were going inside my head, the same balls of light. And I was kind of freaked out, you know. I still am to this day. The thing, you know, was in my head. A few weeks later, the same cameraman who had the camera taken away, he was targeted again. We received a frantic call, and I do mean frantic call, from Jackie Hernandez. Ah! I'm not staying here very long here. I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here. And so I went up uh, with uh, another researcher, Gary. I said something to Gary about, I don't think anything's happening up here. It seems like it's kind of quiet. And the minute I said that, bang, this, whatever it was, pulled me forward. And there was a snapping sound, like somebody snapping their fingers three times. This real loud, right in front of all three of us heard it. And we started yelling up there, get down, get out of the attic, something's going on down here. Get down, get, get down! I blacked out for a moment. You just hear him grasping for breath. Sure. What's wrong? What happened? And the next thing I know is I see a flash. He flashed it in my face because he had to see where I was. It was dark up there. And I didn't know it, but I had something around my neck. I could feel pressure on my neck, and something was lifting me. I remember that very vividly. He was off the ground hanging, and the picture that he took before he even got there is proof of this. He was just wrapped around one of these, these rafters. I had a, a clothesline, plastic clothesline, that was tied in a seaman's knot, hanging on a nail on a rafter, and there was pressure on the nail. A clothesline was being placed around his neck, and he was being pulled up to a nail and, and hung on a nail. If it wasn't for his colleague who was up there, he would not have gotten down off that. He might, may have been, you know, murdered. So it was an actual hanging because I had red marks on my neck. I could feel this. This was still on my neck when I, when I left the attic. Gary, I says, you know, it's definitely raising hell. We gotta get out of here. There's footage of me actually coming down from the attic. What the hell happened? Are you okay, buddy? Oh, God. Look at his neck. Oh, Jeff, what's behind your neck? Well, I don't know what's on my you neck. Like and they could see that the clothesline was around my neck that had the Siemens knot tied into it. You can see in the footage that also there's red marks all over my neck. His neck was just red with the imprint of the clothesline that was there. The clothesline was probably twisted and hung up on the nail with enough pressure to really give me, you know, a pretty good strong marks on the neck. This thing, I still believe to this day, it had the potential to kill. It could have killed me, I think. And if I continued on this haunting, what if it does kill me? That was the last time I ever entered that house. I think it was more than one entity 
I saw two different apparitions, the one in the attic, I saw the one on the bed. I believe that, that the old man was the entity of John Damon who built the house in the early 1900s. I think that that was, he had died there and stayed there. I think that this was also a merchant marine who worked on one of the ships, but he was murdered by somebody who lived in the house. And I think that that entity came back to the house and, and seeking revenge. He never found it, but he ended up staying in that house. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost story begins because I own a haunted house. It's called the McPike Mansion. I really didn't know it was haunted when I bought it. And the way we bought the house was purely because I like old houses. And I really wasn't thrilled to find out that it was haunted because I really didn't believe in ghosts. Um, Henry Guest McPike had the house built in 1869 by Lucas Pfeifenberger, and it was a second empire Italianate with a mansard roof. Mr. McPike and his family lived there till 1910 when he died in the house. Since that time, there has been no occupants other than the spirits of the house. When I first bought the house, I actually believed that I saw a man in the window. He had a striped shirt and a tie on, and I thought, am I really seeing this? because it looked like a real person, but it wasn't a real person because suddenly he just vanished. I'm very interested in old architecture. And um, I had heard that there was a historical house from the mid 1800s that uh, was something, it was kind of a must see. I had the opportunity to actually tour this beautiful mansion, this McPike mansion. And um, the, the owner, Sharon Ludicky, was, was kind enough to agree to take me through the house. And she had a couple friends there and they met up with us later. I didn't really expect, however, to meet a ghost myself that day while visiting. While we were in the basement, um, something just extraordinary happened. There was a sort of a free-floating mist would appear and disappear as we moved through the room. And it had absolutely no um, reason or rationale for why it would be there. It would simply form in a room, move around, and move to a different room. <gasps> The basement apparently is where most of the hauntings take place. When I saw the video, that's when I truly became convinced that it was something paranormal. We noticed that there was a very, very thick mist forming at the end of one of the rooms. And so thick that we couldn't see the brick wall behind it. You could watch the mist move in and out, dissipate, reappear, um, go from room to room. That was absolutely convincing for me. The mist sort of came right at me. Oh, big time mist, big yeah, time, here. big time. It was almost like it was coming into my face. But it almost had sort of a purple haze to it. It wasn't like a white mist. It was kind of a lavender purple mist. And when I stepped into this mist, it was icy, icy cold. And I could feel the mist sort of moving under my clothes. I could feel it against my skin. And it was almost like it was buffeting me, like there was air movement. And this was a totally enclosed um, room. It was like a box. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Literally my teeth started chattering and I had to step out of it. I stepped out of it, walked the 15 feet or so back to where the group was, turned around and the mist was completely gone. We ended up seeing it in three different rooms during the period of time that we were down there. It would just simply appear in one room and be incredibly thick, and then it would just disappear. Wow, it just cleared up a lot. The mist seemed to almost have a will of its own. It would form in rooms that we had just left. Did you see that? Yeah. 
it, it wouldn't form in a room that we were in. It would almost wait till after we left that room and it would form in that room, but it would still sort of allow us to experience it and then it would just surprise us by disappearing. I believe that the spirits of the house are a variety of people. One of them is the Honorable H.G. McPike. It is his house, he is the master of the house, and he is there to stay. There was intelligence in a mist, and I know that sounds crazy, but it, it, was, it was moving for a purpose. It had reason behind what it was moving. Oh my God, I can see it moving right around in front of me. The first time that, that uh, Sharon took me through the house on that very first tour, you know, we just walk into this room and I, I started crying. Whoa, oh my gosh. I believe that the mist was an intelligent spirit that chose to be there. Um, it is my experience with Mr. Henry Guest McPike that if he doesn't want to do something, he doesn't do it. I've come to understand that there's more in the ghost world, if you will, than just little glimpses of our former selves. That there really can be a consciousness. There really, there really can be something very powerful about us that, that remains. Um, because this mist was just very overpowering and it, it displayed so many aspects of, of intelligent activity. My ghost story. I was facing the graveyard and I saw a white figure in the back of the graveyard and it was moving slowly toward the house. My ghost story. My ghost story takes place in a home right next door to a graveyard. The graveyard here goes back to Early 1800s, some of the people were born in late 1700s, and there are children here that probably died of childhood diseases. Over the years, we've had relatives come, of course, and spend the night, and friends spend the night, and some of them have had experiences here. Even before we moved in, there was a friend of my son's who was fishing and saw who he believed was a white, misty woman walking in the graveyard. He uh, packed up his fishing tackle and left and said he would never come fishing again at night. Sometimes the ghosts don't stay in the graveyard. They come into the house, and they like to do little things so that they know, that I know that they're around. In the upstairs bedroom, I have a oval picture of myself at about two years old. And one day I walked in there, and the picture was turned exactly horizontal. I just thought, well, the ghost has been up here and playing little tricks. One night, my husband and I and my young son were spending the night at my mother and father-in-law's house, and I couldn't sleep. I was facing the graveyard, and I saw a white figure in the back of the graveyard, and it was moving slowly toward the house. I couldn't imagine what white thing would be in the graveyard, so I just kept watching it, and it, as it got closer and closer, I kept thinking, well, I'm gonna get a good look at it. But as it came closer to the front of the graveyard, it just went away. Well, that's not all that I saw. As I was standing there looking out, trying to see this white thing. All of this mist just came rushing down the road, and then there was this other mist that was just kind of hanging in the air, and it was like the two came together, and they, it, they kind of moved around this way and that, and then they just began to swirl. I was really fascinated by this, and I thought, uh, this is something that people don't see all the time. Tina had set up the uh, video cameras and the tape recorders, and uh, 
on the uh, tape recorder was words to the effect that the little girl's name was Molly. We found through uh, historical records that there was a Molly Glasscock and that uh, she's buried in an unmarked grave. We cannot find a gravestone for her. Her, her father is and mother are there and they do have stones. The video camera was left running and there was no one out there at the time. When uh, they came back and viewed the video, that's at the time that uh, the little spirit made her little appearance, little dance around the gravestones. I felt, well, now there's really proof that they are here and are active and can be seen on camera. It didn't surprise me at all to see the video and to see that moving around among the tombstones because I had seen the mist or the vapor long before the video was shot. So I feel that that shows that there is definitely something haunting their graveyard. I think ghosts are spirits of the people that are have died and some of them I think probably go to another plane but some for one reason or another either they choose to stay or they're not able to get to the other plane or have no help uh, are still here. My ghost story began when I was working at Granada Hills Community Hospice. A hospice is a, a unit or a designated area that's uh, for individuals to eventually pass away. My office was around the corner from the hospice unit and from time to time I would hear stories or people talking about unusual circumstances that occurred in the hospice area. Hospice could be deemed as haunted because we had so many people pass away there. At the hospice, we experienced a lot of strange events. We're talking about almost weekly or daily encounters. Especially at nighttime when things were quiet and calm. Charts would be knocked off the top of a counter. Lights going off and on, televisions going off and on. There was guitar music when there shouldn't have been. Pins, pencils being taken out of your hands. People talking to other people in the room and when you went in there was nobody there. Items moved around, flowers rearranged. The call lights would come on and you'd go into the room and there'd be somebody that would not be able to touch or handle a call bell. I had gone into a patient's room with a syringe feeding tube. I dropped it on the ground, and what happened next was really amazing. The tube flew up into the air and landed right back into my hand at about this height. It made sense in a way because a hospice unit generally is a place where people come to die. It was a kind of in a dark area. It was a big storage closet, and I always found it very cold when I went inside, so I didn't want to stay long. Many other nurses had problems in there. They would go in, they would find things taken out of their pockets even. A lot of people had a lot of bizarre experiences in that room with items dropping, items moving, the lights flickering in and off in the room. My husband Andy had been ill for some years. We admitted him to Granada Hills Hospital and it was determined to put him in the hospice unit. And he was fascinated by the noises and the stories and he had shared that when one of his friends came to visit him. His friend dabbled a little bit in camera work and said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if I could set up a camera one night and see if we can get any of this activity or noise, you know, actually on video. So his friend showed up with a camera and decided that he was going to put the camera in the closet while he went and got some dinner. 
when his friend came back. And he was so enthusiastic and excited, and he said, you know, I looked at the video, and I've got something. And we were, wow. So we shut the door, and all gathered around Andy's bed, and he took the camcorder, his friend, and showed the video. And the hair on my arms went up. And there was kind of a smoky cloud at first, but then the cloud became more imaged, took more of a shape, and, a, and the shape was an actual face. You could see the nose, you could see the forehead, you could see the lips. The face was somewhat elongated, and as we were watching the face, it changed and evolved into a caricature of a face. And the face was almost like a skull, the, the deep, dark eyes. And it was not a friendly face. And I remember sitting back really fast because it startled me so much to see this face that became this apparition. When we got over the initial impact, I, I looked at Andy's friend and I said, you you just took that video, right? And he said, yeah, I looked at it and I couldn't hardly wait and had to run in and show you guys. So he said, the video's maybe 20 minutes old. What he caught was something creepy. I mean, it was the most amazing photograph I have ever seen. You could see this image come out of the darkness and it would fade in and it'd come back out again. And it would, it looked like it almost fade into something else, but it was definitely an image. I see a black apparition coming towards the camera. I see the outline of a face. I see the bony structure of the face, the nose, the cheekbones, the mouth, and very deep sunken, penetrating eyes. Perhaps they're looking at the camera saying, why are you here? My ghost stories. My ghost stories. My ghost stories. My ghost stories. The story began in the early 90s when I moved into a house that had activity in it. And right away, uh, you, you got, could just sense it in the house as soon as, as soon as you went into it. Huckert moved into the house with me, and um, we were roommates for a while. I was sitting home one day, I was working at the table, and all of a sudden the bathroom door opened by itself. So I thought, well, maybe that's a sign. So I took the camera and I took a picture and got some weird white, look cloudy looking stuff. And on the photographs, the Polaroids were glowy objects, like your typical, what would look like a ghost photograph. And then I got the camera and I shot a picture of him standing in the hallway where most of that stuff took place and got a picture of him with glowy object thing. Um, and that was the beginning of the, the story. I stood in the place which we've subsequently gotten to know as the vortex in front of the bathroom and he took a picture and it's like this light and kind of glowing. Actually the very first pictures were kind of scary. They, were, they had images on it like with faces and stuff that looked like what you would think a ghost looked like. And I think, my opinion, that the entity was trying to get our attention, saying, you want to see a ghost, this is what a ghost looks like. One of the, the early photographs was a very ghosty looking image that looked almost like some type of mummy wrapped up or something that was glowing. And after about two or three months, had quite a few shots of this, so we decided it was time to like tell our friends about it. We invited everyone over. We'd have Halloween parties where we'd have 50, 60 people, they would come in and we start taking pictures and we get all kinds of pictures. So they were all looking at him, they were all amazed, and then uh, one of our friends said, well, are they, is it here now? And we, we took a picture and we got another Polaroid with lots of wispy cloud things in it, but in the negative space of those, you could see the word, yes. Someone asked, like, what's your name? And he gave us the name of Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. So that was the beginning of the communication. We've been told that there are quite a few different spirits in the house, but only one of them communicates with us through Polaroid pictures, and that is a spirit called Wright. Uh, when I first saw the writing, I was, it was amazing, because up to that point, we just saw 
wispy things in the, in the room that weren't there when he shot the photos. When we saw the word, this is amazing. What is going on here? What's happening? Why this? Why, why my house? I first saw the writing, I, uh, it was stunning. It was terrifying. It was, I, it was amazing. I didn't know what to think because it's one thing to think you're capturing something that's sort of moving through the house, some kind of spirit thing. It's another to think that the spirit is so aware of you and aware of your presence and being able to communicate on an intellectual level. That was startling. You could either ask a question, think a question, and take a picture. You never know when it's going to show up, so you just keep doing it until something shows up. And it got to a point where you didn't even have to ask anything out loud. Whoever took the picture and would focus on it, it would answer their question, whatever they would think in their heads. That was pretty amazing and sort of life-changing in a way because I don't know anybody else that's happening to. Polaroid was there. A gentleman from Brooks Institute of Photography was there. Um, we were getting photographs while they were there and with uh, controlled cameras and controlled film and they couldn't figure it out. What do you guys want to ask, uh, write a question? Did he die in this house? Yeah. Did he die? Yeah. And here's the photograph. It just came out of the camera. It looks like it says corpus delecti. The basic element of a crime, as in murder. The death of a murdered person. Sounds like he's telling us he got murdered here. I don't know. That's really bizarre. That's kind of creepy. The writing on the photographs have said many, 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 many things because there are quite a few photographs. And um, sometimes it's very serious, sometimes it's very profound, but it does give you some guidance, it gives you ideas. And one of the questions we asked him, why are you here? And he said, to help, which I thought was pretty amazing. Uh, one of my favorite uh, messages was when uh, a friend of ours took a picture of three of us and it said, truth is the currency of love. And I just love that message. I thought that was very, very positive. Well, these occurrences have always given me a lot of different feelings about my approach to life. It's changed a lot of my belief system. I don't know, I'm not afraid to die anymore. What's going on in my house is probably evidence of some kind of afterlife, some kind of communication with that other side, whether it's someone who lived before, someone who've never lived, or just some kind of spirit who is manifesting. That's all I could say. I have had many fears throughout my life and I've conquered, I think, basically all of them because this has given me a look beyond just my life and just this particular plane of existence. So it's had a profound effect upon me, personally. All I can say, if you're skeptical, just spend the night there. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost. My ghost.